that without the microphone you probably couldn't hear me at all. So we have this uh, problem with um, with the time scale and thumbs and also the size. So people uh, um, have been thinking about simplifying simulations, and uh, one way to do this is shown here. It's called coarse graining, where you are describing for a system not every atom, as you see on the left side, but rather you simplify the description by pooling several atoms into one, what you call a bead, um, uh, like a bead of a necklace. Uh, and then you are moving the beads. And that simplifies it because you have to calculate less interactions. Uh, the beads are, have the combined mass of the atoms, so they're heavier. As a result, they move more slowly. So you can take longer integration time steps. And also, the interactions between the beads are average interactions. As a result, they are smoothed out. And so uh, you don't have so many ups and downs. And so you can uh, move much faster from A to B than if you have these rugged landscapes that you get in the energy landscape when you have all atoms uh, included in the description. So, so here you, you see one strategy. You have, a, for example, a peptide that has these side groups. And you represent the side groups by one or two beads that are, um, that are uh, depends if it's a bigger side group, you take two beads. If it's one side group, only one bead. You describe the backbone of the protein by a bead for each uh, amino acid. And so you are getting now a simpler description. Uh, you can do the same for lipids. If you have a membrane protein, you describe the lipids not by every atom, but rather by these beads that you see here. But you always have to be careful. You must always check if the simplification is justified. And uh, so here you see an example, a lipoprotein. That is a protein that's shown here in green and in blue to identical proteins that have the tendency to scoop up lipids for example, in the bloodstream, they're very important. They are, they are the so-called good cholesterol in the doctor's office. Uh, good cholesterol is actually not cholesterol, but it's a protein that binds cholesterol. They have the good cholesterol and the so-called bad cholesterol protein. And this is a good one here. And here you see how it works. You are getting, you're seeing here in a, in a simulation going for a few microseconds, how the system is uh, is uh, um, is taking these uh, these lipids, and if I go here and I move a little bit, then you see that uh, three-dimensional a little better. It's like a disc, and uh, now you want to be sure that it's correct. You see here how these particles uh, assemble, and now what you can do is you take the the simplified description, the coarse grain description, and you reverse it to the all atom. You find a representative all atom that corresponds to this simplified description. And here you are now doing, through computing, an, an experiment that is called small angle X-ray scattering. You scatter X-rays at a small angle, and you're getting a signal, and you calculate the signal, and in color, you're getting the calculation for this sample. And in black, you, you, you see the, the measured signal, uh, as measured in, an, in a beam line, uh, in this case at Argon. Actually, this, the, the graduate student who did it did both a simulation and the measurements. And you see they agree very nicely. You know, you see a little difference. But if you know the field, you say, oh, this is a very nice agreement. So you know that the shape of this particle was correctly, uh, um, uh, was correctly described. So 
So this is a coarse graining where you are, where you have actually a very pre, rather precise description still. Here we have a coarse grain description where we have uh, many fewer beads, like uh, the, the previous one we had 10, 10 atoms per bead. Here we have uh, about 50 to 100 atoms per bead. And this is a, a virus capsid that has these proteins that make the capsid. It's a protein that, that has two hands, a long hand and a short hand. And now if you want to describe this by beads, you cannot just have the beads according to the mass of the protein because then all the beads were in the main part of the protein, but you have to get the topology right. You have to get one arm and the other arm correctly described. So you have to distribute the beads so that you're getting also the topology of the, of the protein well described. But then, you know, you are getting this description, very simple, and now you can do uh, uh, work with it and, for example, describe this experiment. An experiment where with an atomic force microscope you indent uh, the capsid just little or very strong. We have a non-linear indentation. First we have two linear indentation, just a little and just a little, and then very strong indentation. And what you measure is you calculate it in the simulation and you measure an experiment is how much force you need for the indentation. And here you see the experiment and the simulation compared. And you see that they agree very nicely with the linear indentation that becomes a nonlinear part. And you are getting very nice agreement. So it looks like uh, this uh, model describes this capsid quite nicely. And so again, you see, you can simplify, but you must test it. So, um, so now we want to do a little example. And here we have a potassium channel. So we have a protein that has actually um, that looks here that it is uh, that it has uh, um, uh, um, that it has a mirror symmetry. And in the middle, it has ions, in this case, potassium ions, that are conducted to the protein. In reality, the, the protein has mirror symmetry here and mirror symmetry here. It's a fourfold symmetry, actually. But uh, in order to show it better, we just show the two left and right sides and not the front and back. And, um, and so now, if we want to describe it, we have to get the PDB structure. Then we have to build the PSF gen file. And we have to use PSF gen to get the PSF file. We have to check if, they are, if the parametrization is unusual. This is a normal protein, so we don't have to worry about needing new parameters. And then we, we, uh, we can use it with NMD. But we have to put lipids around it because it's a membrane protein. These are the lipids that, that are in the membrane. And you see the lipids are pretty complicated. They are not very straight, but this is straight, but some of them are pretty disordered. And so now to get the lipids around the protein is not quite trivial. When you put them there, you first have gaps, and then you must squeeze the lipids close to the protein using constant pressure simulations. So that is, for example, one way when you need constant pressure simulation when in order to get the, your sample to the right density. You are then saying, ah, I know the pressure, and then I apply the pressure until I have the desired pressure, and then the system automatically assumes the right density. Here we don't have yet the right density, but if we apply the pressure, then we are getting nice density around the protein. Here the lipid is in green, you see it goes very nicely to the protein. Here we are added water, and now we can simulate the protein. We have now, in this case, 38,000 atoms, 5,000 water molecules, uh, 100 POPE lipids, 34 POPG lipids, uh, we have some potassium ions, we use uh, force field parameters from the charm force field 26, 
So there are several force fields. You really want to take the latest one. So I'm sure, sure today we are already like 37 or something. So this will be all the force field. And so on, we, we, we computed at 300 Kelvin. We, uh, we had an NPT ensemble at an ambient pressure, one atmosphere. Okay, we, we computed here in Pittsburgh. And, uh, and now we, we compare the result of, uh, uh, of the simulation. And we first look how much your, the protein deviate from the initial structure that we gave it. And you see that the protein, this is the root mean square deviation per atom. How many angstrom does an atom move away from the initial structure? And you see it moved away by about 1.5 angstrom. You may say, oh, this is bad, 1.5 angstrom is almost a chemical bond. But it's very good because when you are looking at the theory of thermal motion, you find this is just a thermal motion. If you have a normal thermal motion in the protein, this is uh, the, the deviation of an atom from the thermal motion. So it's a very, very good fit. 1.5 angstrom, that means the, the protein is very stable. Here you can look at the mobility for each side group. These are the side groups. And protein have 120 side groups. And you see that the side groups are, some of them have very little mobility, some have high mobility. Little, little higher, little. Where do you think, why do these have higher mobilities? And here we have little mobility. What do you think? Loops what? Loops That's right. So these are, these are the ends. They are very, very mobile here at the end here, this and this. And uh, these guys here are in the middle. And uh, the loops, this loop here or this loop there, they have higher mobilities. So you, you look at oh, which amino acid, oh, they're up in the loop, no problem. And here we have, uh, in the middle of the protein, very little mobility. You say, oh, great, that's uh, where the conduction takes place. That's where we have to need precision. And so on. So you see, you can look a little bit at the statistics. And then you can see the motion. And here you see the, how, you know, we take all the lipids and water away. We just look at the ions, and you see how the ions are conducting through there, through a knock-on mechanism. One iron comes from the bottom and knocks, in this case, two away, actually. And now when a new one comes, I would knock those two up. So they go one by one, and that is how they go. And this is a potassium channel just with a potassium conductance. And here you see, actually, a nerve channel that conducts also potassium. Looks in the middle very similar. But it has on the side what are called voltage gate because in, an, in a neuron, the conduction depends actually on the voltage of the, new, of the nerve cell. And so as you conduct ion through the membrane of the nerve cell, you are changing the voltage. And as a result of the change, these guys here, they're called the voltage gates, they pull the channel open and close it. So you're getting a nonlinear characteristic for the response of the nerve cell to, to voltage. And if you just have this one here, you just basically get Ohm, Ohm's law for conducting across a, the voltage across the membrane. But with these gates, you're getting much more interesting um, behavior, like the signaling of nerve cells comes from it. And so this comes from here. And now you can also look at this more complex system that requires over 300,000 atoms to simulate. You see the beautiful structure, lipid, membrane taken away, water taken away. And you see here how the system looks like. Uh, and uh, so you're still in the middle. You still have the same uh, voltage gate, the same uh, potassium channel, but you have then on the side you have these uh, voltage gates, one of them showing transparent and some of them showing in full. And so that is how the system looks like. Okay, so, okay. so this might be now a good moment for questions. So you ask some questions and then, um, then we continue. So you better 
ask me some question because in the next section of the lecture I will ask you some questions. So you can delay my question by asking questions now. Confused. Yeah, what I Life is confusing. <laughs> Science is confusing. So in one case we do the crystal structure, we fold it. The protein try to fold, try to fold, then close, but then it couldn't, couldn't, couldn't. Then suddenly it, it stuck there, and then we continued the simulation and show that it stayed there. So it was clear we reached the goal. Simple case. That's a crystal structure. We fold it. Okay. But in some other case, not so simple. So sometimes you have proteins that, are, that can assume the states are usually very similar. You can hardly see the difference with your eyes. In the folded form, you can sort of see, but, uh, but you cannot see. But then you see details are really important to activate, for example, an environment. Life. Face it. Life is confusing. That's really what I can only tell you. Be careful. The proteins are, uh, can assume several structures and be careful before you draw conclusions. Usually somebody asks me the question and I think I should have given that answer to all of you. What do you learn from this? How do you know that you are right or that something? You can now end and write a paper. Usually you can write a paper when you have an insight, you learn something. You go like, ah, oh, there's something, even if it's slightly wrong. But it's really, there's something I showed you. Uh, it's usually not like you, the computer runs, it gives you numbers. You don't quite understand them, but it agrees with the experiment. Now I publish. I say, here, I did a simulation. I get the same conductivity as it's measured. Uh, I don't know why, but, uh, you know, nature, please take my paper. That's not so good. Whereas if you, if you have a paper where you, where you, do something, a simulation, it agrees with experiment, you also learn something, you realize something, and usually it should be something better that is not that complicated, that is an insight that is, yes, you did the simulation, but very often you say, oh my God, I could have learned it without the simulation. The simulation helped me to think. It made me more sure about it. Maybe if I would have thought about it, I would have said, oh, maybe it's wrong. But now I see it in the simulation happening. So I say, oh, the idea is actually right. Those are usually the best papers and the, ma the main messages. Yes, OK. So the, there was a question. Um, I was just wondering, for the long-running simulations, like, what people are thinking about you, you so must speak up, error. or maybe I can't, oh. my voice is not so good today, so maybe um, you speak up. Like, for, for longer running simulations, like, what is the kinds of errors we incur because our force fields aren't, like, perfect, and, like, I mean, is our goal just run these longer, or, like, are we really getting a lot more insight out of longer runs? So you, you, need to, you, need to, you need to know what you want to uh, understand, what you, what you want to answer. Like, for example, in, let's say I take some of my recent work, I want to understand, um, uh, I, I want to interpret electron density measured by, by, uh, by electron microscopy. I want to understand in terms of the structure that a big molecule assumes. And so then, I use a computer to try to fit using all the molecular dynamics force field. That's the most realistic description of a protein I can do. I want to fit it into the density. And then once I have a good fit, and I think there's something interesting learned, not just a good fit, but also, oh, now I understand a mechanism of the system. Then I publish it. I say, OK, now I got the structure. It agrees nicely with the density. And I learned something, please 
nature, science, or a biophysics journal, take my paper to tell it to the world. So you have to have a, you have to have a clear question. Let's say I give you my last, my last, uh, um, uh, uh, my last paper that we just submitted to science together with an experimental group. It's a, it is a, in a bacteria, they have some enzymes on the outside of the cell to digest, for example, uh, agricultural waste, uh, or for example, also bacteria in the rumen of cows or in our guts. And these, these, uh, the enzymes that they use, they depend on the time of day, what kind of food is there, and so on. And they put another enzyme there, but it has to stick there really strong. And so when we found that when we bound it there, the enzyme bound nicely, but once we tried to pull it away, it became really strong. It was, even though it was just a complex, it was stronger than, uh, than, uh, than a, a normal chemical bond, a covalent chemical bond. So we wanted to understand why when we pull it, do we get such a strong bond, before not? And then we saw that maybe it was a little bit like when we had the fingers, and when you put the force, they, they rotate like this, and suddenly they fit like this. You got a very, very good fit before. They bound, can go apart, go turn, go on. But once you pull, room, they go like this, and now they are strongly bond. We call it a catch bond, because it, it, it catches when you pull. And so, you know, that was the answer. We, 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 we measured it, we found a very strong bond. We simulated, we found a very strong bond, and we found the reason why we got a strong bond. That you can publish. You have a question, you see the, the simulation answers it, and that is what you can do. But if you just say, oh, I don't understand this, let me simulate it, and go on and on and on, and maybe here it agrees, or maybe there it's about the same size, that you do not good. No, 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 no. You know yourself the answer. You are, you try to put words in my mouth, but you know much better okay. that you have to use your brain. Yes, no, no, you don't have to go further. I'm pretty sure you didn't mean it. <laughs> okay. So why do you want me to say, oh, oh, at this point you can stop and you never have to do anything. You can never stop. You're never sure. Okay. Yes. So, so, so let Maybe the best way you can think of these simulations is they amplify your brain. You, with your brain, you, you, you can imagine something, but you cannot put all the factors together because, you know, it's, these molecules are very complicated. They're sterical interactions and many things. And when you put them in a computer, you can account much more for detail than you can do with your head. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, you want to think about the systems. And so they amplify your brain. And then all the questions that you ask should be questions like, oh, professor, tell me, how should I think about uh, proteins in science? And then you know yourself, you know, you, there's no firm answer. You have to be careful, you have to try, you have to do many trials, and you never, you never know. That's how it is. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So you present your work about HIV capsid, and uh, the system would be uh, like has a 200 something actinomer mm -hmm. and 12 pentamer. So my first question is like, this knowledge must come from uh, like a biology study or whatever, so that you came up with this research to build up this system, right? So, yeah. oh, so, so we we use two kinds of uh, electron microscopy. One electron microscopy that we call tomography, where you see the entire capsid. Not at very high resolution, but you see the entire shape, you know the scale. Then you know, of course, also the size of the, of the protein, then you can immediately quickly estimate uh, uh, how many proteins are there. And you know it's between 1,000 and 2,000 proteins. So then you also know from mathematics how you can call it a theory of tiling, how you can make tiles 
that can enclose an, a, a surface. And um, there are theorems from geometry, and one of the key theorems are from, from Leonard Euler, the mathematician, that tells you you can make a closed surface of hexamas and pentamas. And so you have like, like chicken wire mesh that make these, uh, these, uh, these, 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 uh, these capsid. And then Euler tells you you need always exactly 12 pentamas, not 11, not 13, 12. But you can have any number of, of hexamas. And the hexamas tell you the size of the system. And the pentamas close it. And where the pentamas are tells you the shape. For example, we have seven pentamas on the top and five pentamas on the bottom. So on the bottom, we have small. And then on the top, we have bigger. And so the pentamas distribution tells you what kind of shape you get. And, and uh, hexama tell you what the size is. Now, how do we know that we have pentamas and hexamas? So there, you are, you are, uh, you are uh, growing the, the capsid. You can grow the capsid in in vitro condition. You put a protein, it makes a, it makes capsids. Now, if you use very high salt concentration, you make artificial capsids. For example, with very high salt, you can make a, you can make a capsid without any pentamas. But with a, without pentamas, you cannot close it because Euler tells you you need 12 pentamas. So what you make then is a tube. A tube has always open ends. You make a tube. And so we grew then tubes, and then we did, then we did very high resolution electron microscopy of the tubes, where we knew we have only, or we saw it then through the, through the density, but only hexamas. Then we could see how the hexamas look like in a pure tube. And then we, then we could also do through so crystallography, uh, um, really very smart crystallography where the proteins were connected through, uh, through sulfur, sulfur bonds so that they didn't fall apart. We could make hexama crystals and pentama crystals, but artificial ones. The, 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 the capsid is round, but the crystals were flat. So we had flat hexamas and flat pentamas. And there we saw then how the pentamas and the hexamas look like in a flat situation. So we knew flat pentamas, flat hexamas. We knew curved hexamas. We didn't use need, uh, curved pentamas, but those we did simulation-wise. And it turned out when we took an hexama, we just pulled one protein out and it became a pentama. It became a really nice pentama immediately, very quick. It looked really perfect. All the contact was so good, but we said we believe the computer in this case. And so then we built from these pentamas and hexamas, according to the overall form, we built then the thing, and then we simulated it now for 500 nanoseconds. It stayed completely stable, and now we think we got the right structure. We have one more. Mm -hmm. The second one might relate to what the mm -hmm. just Yes, 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 yes. So I just wanted to know, as, uh, initially when you designed this experiment, do you have some hypothesis or you have some question you try to address or you just try to challenge your computational power? Um, so in, in this case, uh, the experiments were done on purely on the experimental side. So, so they tried to get the structure, but you know, they did all these things like crystallography of pieces, and, uh, and artificial capsids, just like tubular ones. Um, but then they, they came against a brick wall. They couldn't put the capsid together. And then the experimentalist contacted us and asked us if he could help them, because it was clear that you have to put many, many proteins together. You have to do a huge simulation. They said, the only person in the world that, who can do that is you. Would you want to collaborate with us? So they knew everything. They knew the field. They had a, they had a big center, an NIH center on HIV structure. And so they knew the field very well. And so we came pretty late uh, with our computer power, guided by them, learning then as we went on. Today we know a lot, but initially we, we didn't know much. And so basically we just helped the experimentalists 
through computation interpretation of the data. And, uh, but once we had, uh, we had a structure, then of course the structure took on its own life and we could do things with it and learn more with it. And uh, that sort of that it all came. So from, we were pretty innocent. We didn't design anything. They were already in the game for more than 10 years. The people actually who did the structure with whom we work are actually here from the University of Pittsburgh, of, uh, Pittsburgh University Medical School. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, okay, so maybe I go now there and then I go here. I so. Yeah, so, so we, uh, uh, we, we did it in one case uh, where we had an RNA virus and uh, we, we got crystallographic information on the RNA. We were very, very fortunate. It was a very small virus, a satellite tobacco mosaic virus. So there we had it filled and it made a big difference. If we took the, the RNA out, the capsule actually collapsed and only with, with RNA inside did it stay intact. Um, but in, in, in the case of, of our virus, we, we, we are not there yet. So there are many contacts between the phosphate of the RNA and, uh, and the genetic content uh, and the protein. And so it's clear that, that there are interesting interaction points. But uh, so, so far this is, the DNA and the RNA is pretty disordered in there, so there is no one structure likely. And so it's a little difficult to probably need to model it completely, but the model to pack in an, an RNA in this particular capsid is uh, probably complicated. So it will take a few more years, I assume. Mm -hmm. So there was another question here, let me go over there, okay. I'm wondering what's the correlation between the theoretical time, uh, theoretical temperature, and the pressure with the real one. If you set temperature like 100 degrees or um, K, and does it really mean it's the water boiling? Um, yeah, okay, so, <laughs> so the, the temperature is defined uh, through, um, uh, through, is characterized through the equipartition theorem of statistical mechanics is connected, for example, to the kinetic energy of atoms. And it says that each degree of freedom, x, y, z, has a, a kinetic energy one half kBT. And that defines the temperature very well. So, so the, when I tell you about temperature through this very fundamental theorem, I know how it is related to what I see in the simulation, namely the average velocity. So that's not a problem. But then if you ask, okay, good, but when you, when you now change the temperature to 100 degrees Celsius, does water start to boil? There is actually not a question about the temperature. That's a question about how accurately we describe the boiling of water. And, uh, and uh, and so that is a question, how good is the water model that we have in the simulation? And so it's not too bad, but, uh, but the, the, the you never get so exactly the right boiling temperature, like maybe the error is a few 10, deg uh, 10 degrees or something. Freezing, <coughs> you can freeze, but in freezing is all of a slow process. You know, if you, if you, if you put something in the refrigerator, in, in a freezer, it takes a while, even in human time, in, in seconds, minutes, uh, hours. And now in the computer, it takes forever. So, so uh, there was one lucky guy who really li literally lucked out. He's a good friend of mine, so I know the story too. So he saw actually accidentally, more or less, the freezing of water in the computer. So he had water, and he, he cooled it down, and super cooled it, so a little bit below zero, and then suddenly it started to freeze. Because it always starts at one point, and then it develops, boom, boom, and then the whole thing is frozen. 
And so he thought he got a, he got a beautiful cover of nature, and he made a movie out of it with music, and, uh, and, and great, he was just lucky. He never saw anything freezing again in the computer. So, so it's sort of, uh, so freezing and heating is also a, a temporal dimension, takes time, you need to describe something. So in this regard, our temperature doesn't make itself as precisely felt as, uh, as, uh, uh, as you know, in real life. But it's actually also not too bad if some, for example, one of the things that we often talk about in simulation is the folding temperature. So we know that below a temperature protein folds, above it doesn't fold. So we are, we are never very precise, but within 10 degrees or so, we, we get the folding temperature also correct. So it's, it's not an exact thing like you might expect in real life when the student would measure the, the, the boiling point of water and he comes back and tells you it's 91 degrees, professor, you would be very upset. So we don't, we don't reach that kind of precision, but, uh, but in by and large, it's pretty good. So, so when you... Hmm? I just have a quick question about the HIV capsid. Mm -hmm. It looked like the water box was sort of spinning around mm -hmm. the capsid. Mm -hmm. Does the, would the capsid rotate or like see its next image if it like tips or anything like that? Like with like periodic boundary conditions? Like would it bump into the next image? Oh, 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 so we have the box because presently we are using uh, a way to calculate Coulomb interaction to Fourier transform. I, I mentioned this to you, and that requires uh, that we actually do simulations with periodic boundary conditions. And then we have to be sure that, that, the, that, uh, that the individual proteins do not bump into the image of the next one. And so we have to make it distant. We did it distant enough. So when I rotated, I rotated it uh, artificially in the real system. It doesn't rotate like this and bump into the next image. It was just an artificial rotation that I basically took you and moved you around the sample. And now it looks like here, like if the sample rotates rather than you. But the sample was actually standing still and the viewer, the camera was, was moving around. Mm -hmm. So, so they don't they don't bump into each other, but uh, we have now a method that will be released in the next release of NEMBI that comes out in a month or two, where we don't need periodic boundary conditions anymore. We can do the Coulomb calculations without Fourier transform, and now we can uh, we don't have periodic boundary conditions necessary anymore. And then my other question was with um, you were saying that like with the NPT ensemble that mm -hmm. pressure fluctuates a lot. Yes, yes. Right? Um, so is that So if you see the pressure energy? if you see the pressure value you think you did something wrong because it goes really all over yeah, the place. But, like the but that's constant constant with everything. Like energy no no constant. then energy in in this one you have uh, pressure okay. we only have in an NPT ensemble. So we give you we don't give you an NPE ensemble, we only give you an NPT ensemble. And so then temperature is, co is constant, but not energy. Mm -hmm. So energy fluctuates, <laughs> but temperature is constant. Okay. But if the temperature is pretty constant and the pressure looks like it fluctuates a lot, but still is constant over time. Yeah, yeah, it's constant over time, but it is a quantity that shows naturally very strong fluctuation in the simulation. Even if you are sort of correct and you average, it, it will be okay. But if you look at any window, it goes very, very high and very, very low. Like electricity. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you cited some books yesterday, the Understanding Molecular Simulation and the Computer Simulation of Liquids. Those books recommend testing for the sensitivity to the calculated properties with respect to box size, uh, system periodized box size. Mm -hmm. You are running some of the largest simulations ever done. How do you control for that? How do you test for Yeah, these people were talking about liquid properties and not about virus capsids of uh, 1,300 uh, proteins and, and uh, 64 million atoms. So you cannot vary the, the box size 
at least not today. We are glad that we can do one simulation, and I cannot do now in various box sizes. So it's sort of like it's really then the, the computer is shared. We use an enormous fraction of that computer. We might be even the biggest user of the Blue Waters computer, for example. And uh, you know, other people, other fields like weather forecasting, earthquake prediction, and simulation, they also need a computer. So should I tell the earthquake people in, 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 in Southern California, stop your bloody stuff. I need another block box size. So you have sometimes you have to start with just one sample, and of course you have to be very careful. Uh, so we were careful. We did actually two, two very ind completely independent calculations, and we gave people two, uh, two um, structures of the capsid uh, because the capsid, when we look at it with electron microscopy, varies. There is not one capsid, so the capsid doesn't doesn't it look always exactly the same? There's a variation, and so uh, a natural variation. So we, we published actually two structures so that we told the world right away, yes, this is not the structure. We give you two that you realize that there are many, many different structures. But we just could do two, and we couldn't do more. But you know, this is sort of like something when you go to the very edge, very often you have to work with, with often even one example, and, uh, and you have to be careful. You don't, you're basically, the aim is that I don't have to be embarrassed about my publication 10 years ago. So I have to, you know, some got some questions here. How, do you, how are you sure? You are not sure, but basically I'm scared. I don't want to be embarrassed in 10 years. So I only make statements where I somehow feel I'm, I, I'm, I can be quite certain, not to totally certain, that whatever I say is, uh, is true in 10 years or in 20 years and, 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 and further on. And then I rather don't say something when I'm at the edge, particularly when I don't understand something. Then I'm extremely careful. I might even not say even anything. So just like pushing the button, the computer tells you, and you don't understand it, but now you say, I get the agreement. Uh, no. Okay. When did you begin, like, could one use a replica exchange mm -hmm. all the time, or, like, is there some reason, like, to do that versus one mm -hmm. continuous calculation, like, are there mm -hmm. different cases? Or yeah, so, 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 so you had these many minima, we wanted to search through them. And one way of searching is what's called replic replica exchange molecular dynamics, where you run at the same time several, several simulations at different temperatures. They talk to each other, and you always find what is the behavior at 300 Kelvin, but they can jump to the higher temperatures, go over. That way, you accelerate the sampling over the minima. Okay, so when you do this, rather than running one long simulation, yeah, you know, if you run one long simulation, you have high barriers. You never get over the barrier. The chance is very small. You're hanging there, so then it's, if you, 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 you how should I say, sometimes you know the barriers. For example, you can pull something over a barrier. Then you know what forces you see. Then you know how high the barrier is. Then you say, uh, sorry, I have to do, I have to do replica exchange because then I get over the barrier. Or you just do replica exchange. And then you see you're getting into new territory. Then you there were barriers at 600 Kelvin, you got over it. And so then you know from the result of replica exchange, it's good to, 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 to sample at higher temperature to see more territory. But usually when you do with the protein and not the capsid, for example, do you, do you usually do replica exchange just to see, like extend the sampling, make sure that you yeah. So yeah. So so so. Okay. Maybe I give you a concrete answer in terms of the of the capsid. The capsid. If uh, if if my my postdoc who worked on this would come and say, "Oh, Klaus, shouldn't I do a replica exchange?" I would probably tell him, "No. Oh, why not?" So the capsid is is made of 1,300 proteins, 
and the, the proteins are all different. So, you know, you have this everywhere slightly different curvature. So, identical protein, but each protein has a slightly different conformation. So, you have, you have already sampled 1,300 proteins you have there. It is an irregular shape. So, why should I now do some more sampling when I see already 1,300 samples in the calculations? I don't think they would tell me more if I would deform it constantly, because then, you know, the proteins here would deform into something that I had already here to begin with. So I think here I have already natural sampling. I don't need more sampling. That would be my answer. But if you have another process where you feel like, oh, the conformation that I see, they just don't explain to me the behavior that I know from biology. Maybe I don't have the right conformation yet. Then I would say, OK, why don't you replica exchange to see if you are getting uh, other samples. Other samples that, for example, my colleague Emma Takoshi, who studies uh, um, uh, 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 membrane channels that transport sugars. And so the, the membrane channels are open, they bind the sugar, and then they flip, then they open to the bottom and release the sugar. So you have a strong conformational change. And for a long time, they couldn't see it. And then they applied replica exchange, and for the finally they saw this change open inside, open outside form of this of this channel. So they were really motivated to see a large conformational change, and they did then replica change, and they saw something. So there was a real reason there to, to go for it. Whereas in my captive, I have already a lot of different morphology and I don't need to, to have more, I would say. So it's not necessary if you have one protein you study to do necessarily the replica exchange unless you are not necessarily seeing what you were, mm -hmm. what you are yeah. thinking, what you are expecting. Exactly, yes. exactly, yes. Exactly, so yeah, you think about it and then if your brain tells you, oh, maybe I should do replica exchange, I don't have the conformation, then you go for it. So, the message is very simple. Think, use your brain. If your brain tells you, sample more, do replica exchange, don't do replica exchange, whatever. But think of the, of the computer as, an, as a helper to your brain uh, and, and, uh, and not the other way around. The computer guides and you just follow with your brain what the computer suggests. Okay. <coughs> So uh, can you say one full sentence? Sure. When you're running, say, the captive signal, mm. that one executable of NAMD, it's just here. It, yeah, it's, it's, one, it's one NAMD run that runs on, on almost the entire machine. OK. Mm -hmm. So it's not, not many NAMDs working in parallel, because that would be too complicated, two runs on a machine. For them to talk to each other, it's very complicated. They have to probably write to the disk, and the other one goes to the disk, where one program can can go right through memory and talk to the other part of the program. Okay, so now we have two sections, one on simple statistical mechanical properties of proteins. Um, mainly I talk about proteins 
from the point of view of your statistical mechanics textbook rather than about one particular protein. It's biology. I talk about general properties so that you see how well these simulations do in terms of some general uh, characteristics. And then I give you, uh, at the end, some examples of, of current work that you see a little bit, you know, what you do with this simulation a little bit more. So let's look at ubiquitin again. We run our trajectory of ubiquitin. We saw that protein in the, in the VND session yesterday. And so, um, so here you see what I told you already about the potassium channel. You run ubiquitin as a function of time. You are starting here at this moment. And you then you determine what is my deviation per atom from the initial structure. And so due to the thermal motion, the atoms just don't stay where they were in the beginning, but they move about. But then you know that they don't move away and away and away, but they rather become constant. And this value here is exactly what you would expect from statistical mechanics. If proteins, if atoms move around their equilibrium position, that is a kind of value that you expect for them to deviate. And so then you know how this is deviated very quickly, but then it's stabilized, and it's a stable protein. Now, if you're getting something like this, you go here, then you slowly go like here, and here, and here, and here, and here. Then, worry. The protein is falling apart. The protein migrates somewhere else. It's not stable. And you have to find out what is happening. So you can only really analyze proteins that, that have become constant. 1.5 angstrom is a very good value. Sometimes you have disorder due to the proteins might be a little more random, uh, not because of thermal motion, but because of the configurational, a uh, different configuration it can take. It can even go to 2.5 angstrom. You could still feel happy. Once it gets above 3, then you should worry, even if it becomes constant. There could be something that is not, the structure that you deal with is not well defined. It fluctuates around too much. That's usually a problem. But below 2.5 is good. And the more below 2.5 you are, the absolute good it becomes. Now, um, here you see now the motion per, per amino acid along the sequence of the protein. You see you have blue part where you don't move very much. You have red part where you move a lot. And this is an NMR structure. And uh, in NMR, you have the protein not in a crystal, but in a, in a solvent. And you see from the NMR that there's actually a lot of motion going on. Some pieces are very precise, and others are much more jittery. So in an NMR structure, you, you usually see the same what you see in a simulation, that you have uh, more mobile parts, less mobile parts, but particularly you also see the mobility. So in an NMR structure, usually what they publish is not one structure, but as you see here, like 30 structures. And when you superimpose them, you're getting something like this, where some part, the structures are all very much on top of each other, well-defined, and some parts where they are flop, more floppy. And that is the, what the natural outcome of an NMR measurement that sees actually a protein moving in a solvent. Here you see the, 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 the mobility per side group. You see some side groups are more mobile than others. Usually the ones that are inside the protein are less mobile. The ones that are on the periphery are more mobile. And so you, you understand that also well. So now, uh, here's now a little bit of the theory of the motion of the atoms that you can actually see from crystallography. When you, when you do crystallography, you are, um, you are uh, uh, seeing the X-ray scattering, and you see then particularly strong scattering in certain angles. In other angles, you see almost no scattering. But in certain angles, you see strong 
uh, scattering due to what is called Bragg's law. And the, and the property that makes certain angles scatter very strongly, others not, is this quantity. Fj describes how an atom is scattering x-rays, and this one tells you how the radiation that is being scattered by the various atoms in a, in a crystal, how they interfere with each other. This is a typical radiation uh, amplitude. It's a complex amplitude. I is a complex a number I. And, uh, and so this is a quantity that describes actually the scattering. And now if, if the crystal atoms are all fixed, this is the quantity that describes the, the ideal uh, uh, diffraction or the Bragg scattering. But in reality, you have a fixed average position, but any moment in time, you have a motion described by uj of t. So you have to replace that rj by an rj of t, where one part is time independent and this part is time dependent. So then you have to look, you have to average now this kind of thing over many, many atoms. And this is what you do here. So you have this one, and now the average. But if we have now this one in the exponent, then this piece gives us this factor, just looks like this one, except we have now the xj in the average position and not the momentaneous position. And then here we are getting now an average due to the motion, due to the thermal motion. So this one just looks like the ideal theory, but we are getting another factor. And this factor is due to the thermal motion. And it's always smaller than one. And when the motion is too big, this one becomes zero. And then we don't see anything anymore. We have too much motion. But, uh, but usually it's not close to zero, but it's also not one. It is somewhere in between. And this quantity can be calculated. So I don't want to do a, a physics class with you, but if you are looking at it, and you think this is an harmonic oscillator motion, then you can calculate, 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 and at the end, this is what you get. You're getting here that this is this quantity where uj is a, is a, is a, is a fixed number, the thermal motion. It's given by this quantity, and so then you are, you are, you are, uh, the scattering is determined by by the ideal scattering, fj times this factor, attenuated by this one. You see that it's e to the minus, so it's smaller than 1. And if the temperature is very high, e to the minus large, 0. But uh, the temperature is never that high. And so you're getting here an, an, a factor. It's called the de weller factor that tells you how much every atom is moving. And so what the crystal reference is doing is they change the temperature. And from the change in temperature, they know what this factor is. And then they tell you how each atom is moving. And usually, you're getting this value in the, in the PDB. And then you know how much thermal motion is connected with every, with every uh, atom that there is. OK. So this is, um, you also call it the better value for historical reasons. They call it the better value. And uh, so the better value or the, or the nearby wall effect on that what is. OK, so that's important when you look at the PDB. Now we are doing something here. And now comes a question to you. So we are doing more economic simulation. And we would like to calculate the potential energy, the average contribution to the potential energy. Here are the various terms to the energy. This is the kinetic energy. And this is uh, the difference in the, in the potential energy from the bond vibration, angular vibration, dihedral, and Coulomb, and Van der Waals. Now I would like to know from you, um, when we are measuring this as a function of temperature, how does this term look like as we change temperature? Will it be constant? Will it be exponential? What will it be? This term, this term. Yeah, 
but how? Linear, exactly. <laughs> Very good. Some people don't see that. So here's the answer. It goes linear with the temperature. Okay, good. Correct. So how here? This one. What? No, no, no. You want to know how this one moves with the temperature. So if this one will be, li we say the kinetic energy will go linear with the temperature. This one, how will this one go with the temperature? Anybody? So, so there is this, I mentioned this briefly before, the, there's an equipartition theorem of thermodynamics that tells you that every quadratic degree of freedom of kinetic energy or potential energy goes linear with the temperature. This is quadratic in the velocity, goes linear with the temperature. This is quadratic in coordinates, goes linear in the temperature. This quadratic in the angle goes linear with the temperature. This one doesn't go, is not quadratic. We don't know. No, no, no theorem about it. This one, no theorem about it. This one, no theorem about it. So if we now do the calculation, then This is what we get. This one goes linear. And the number you, you read off there is actually how many atoms we have in the system. If you know the linear dependence, then you know Kb, you know 3 half, and you can calculate quickly from the slope how many, how many atoms there are. Here we have similarly, we know how many vibrational terms we have here or there. And you can look up. In the PSF file, it tells you we have this many angular vibrations, and you find it's correct. We have this, uh, this many bond vibrations, you find it's correct. So each of these terms go like exactly like this for each degree of freedom, one half kBT. OK, so we go linear. But then we have here these ones. Yeah, you may, you know, it, you, you, maybe you think it's linear, but you know, it's basically almost constant. This kinetic energy goes up and down. The total energy goes linear mainly because these guys go linear, and they dominate the energy. So this is why the total energy increases. But so that is uh, what you find in terms of uh, some motion. But you see that your protein obeys statistical mechanics. The ones that are supposed to go linear go linear in temperature. So very interesting. So now we look a little bit more into statistical mechanics. We look at an, at an atom. We pick out one atom, and we plot for this atom of the x, y, and z component of the velocity. So here the velocity goes up and down, up and down, and up and down over time. But if we square the velocity and plot it, we are getting then this distribution. And this distribution of the velocity here is exactly the Maxwell distribution of the velocity. You know from the from the um, from statistical mechanics that that that, um, that 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 atoms are Maxwell distributed in their velocity, and you see that every individual atom with their x, y, and z component obey Maxwell's velocity uh, law, uh, and uh, even though. Mendy has never read any statistical mechanics textbook, it's just classical mechanics. But you have a system of many coupled atoms, and so automatically they obey the, uh, the Maxwell law. So the statistical mechanics is very well represented, even by a small protein that just had a few thousand atoms. So you should remember that when you are dealing with, 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 uh, with little Macromolecules, even though they're small, they're not a liter of water with an Avogadro number of atoms, you still obey very nicely statistical mechanics. And you should, you should use your head to, to, to keep that into, to take that into account. Okay, so now we, now we, uh, we plot now as a function of time the kinetic energy. So this is the kinetic energy we calculated for our ubiquitin protein system. We calculate kinetic energy. And we know 
uh, we know now the kinetic energy on average uh, is related to the temperature. Now, if we are now dividing the kinetic energy by this factor, then we call this one the, 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 the temperature. And the temperature fluctuates because the kinetic energy fluctuates. It has a fixed value, this case 100 K, but it fluctuates around. So, so why do you think the temperature fluctuates? Why is the temperature not constant? Why do you think it fluctuates? What? No. So it, so it fluctuates. We, we actually we have, we, we took actually a system where we have fixed walls. So energy is not taking in and out. And, uh, and, uh, and so we, we have now here, so energy is not dissipating anywhere. We didn't control temperature. We, uh, but we are getting this behavior. And so, so you should, I don't want to tell you too much about statistical mechanics, but you need to know the following that um, if you do an NVT ensemble simulation, you control the temperature. If you do an NVE ensemble simulation, you don't control the temperature. But it doesn't mean that the system doesn't have a temperature. An NVE ensemble has also a fixed temperature, except you don't know which one. So if you read your statistical mechanics table, it tells you that which ensemble you use doesn't mean one of them has a temperature, other one doesn't. No, no, they both have a fixed temperature. Both of them obey the laws of statistical mechanics. Only in one case, you, you know what it is. In the other case, you don't. And so if we do here an NV, NVE ensemble simulation, then we don't know what the temperature is. But we see here the temperature happens to be pretty close to 100. But why is it not constant? So, so one, one problem could be numerical error. You know, you make numerical errors, and then one time it's a little bit too high, one time a little bit too low. But it's not numerical error. If we are plotting, if we are plotting these values relative to 100, we are getting a Gaussian distribution with a certain width. And now, you can calculate. Um, you can calculate for your system by taking into account that the system has a finite number of atoms. It's not an infinite number of atoms like Avogadro. You can calculate what should be the distribution of the temperature, and you find it should be Gaussian, where the width is two times temperature squared divided by three n where n is the number of atoms. So if you have very many atoms, like Avogadro, this is very sharp. But you don't have, you have a few hundred or few thousand atoms, and so you're getting a finite width. So you are, so you are you're obeying statistical mechanics on the average value, but since you have a finite system, the system have a slight distribution in the statistical mechanical state variables. They are not precisely defined. But uh, I mean, they are, they are precisely defined. This is, a, this is exactly the value that you would expect. Here you actually, on the next slide, you see the comparison of the formula. You see here the measurement from the, from the simulation, the dots. And here you see the theory. And you see the theory agrees very well with, uh, with, uh, uh, with, with the distribution. So the, so the width is only due to the fact that you have a finite system. So, so, so in short, your biomolecular system obeys statistical mechanics very well. But then if you look precisely, then only for the average value, you always get a little distribution, not because of some error, but rather because you have a finite system, and statistical mechanics, as you read in the textbook, is only for infinite systems. If you, if you, um, if you are a physicist and you have a better textbook of, of thermodynamic statistical mechanics, then you always have the towards the end of each chapter, you have a finite, finite system behavior, where you get exactly this kind of behavior described. So in my statistical mechanics book that I use for teaching, 
there's always a chapter where you find the finite size effect described, and this is exactly what you have here. So it's really good statistical mechanics, and you can even use it to check your simulations. Like you are getting a distribution like this, you measure the widths, you compare to the CU, you think, oh, everything looks good in my simulation. So you can use it in, in many ways. Okay, good. So, um, oh, I don't know, you, I look light into your faces. Not that much excitement. Should I give you one more statistical example, or should I rather go to, to more biological things? Okay, I give you one more. Okay, one more. Okay, good. So this one is actually sort of a cute one. It's a we simulate a protein, and here's our protein that we want to simulate, and uh, we simulate it as follows: we put it in a in a spherical container, and we have this this protein initially at 300 Kelvin, but now the container here. We make, we turn into a refrigerator. And we put the temperature here to 200 Kelvin. So here we are enforcing the temperature to be 200 Kelvin with a trick that I showed you by adding to the Newton equation these two terms, the friction term, the fluctuating term. So now we have 200 Kelvin, but this one starts in 300 Kelvin. We don't do any cooling there, but we would expect that it cools down at the end, it also assumes 200 Kelvin. So let's look. So we, we, we do it. And here we see how the temperature drops. This is just over 5 picoseconds. The temperature drops from 300 to close to 250. And if you wait more, it goes to 300 Kelvin. I just showed the beginning. And here are the, here are the numbers. I show the beginning only because I want to see the precise value. So here are the dots that are measured in the simulation. And I have a curve through there, which is actually a theoretical curve. Now we see where that curve comes from. Because if we have this, if we have this, this protein, just like in a good steak, a protein, and now we are cooling it outside, the heat move from the inside to the outside. It's, it's heat diffusion. And so we can use heat diffusion theory to describe this process. Heat diffusion theory, this is, a, this is the heat diffusion equation or heat conduction equation, where the temperature just obeys the diffusion law. And so here we have 200 Kelvin. Inside we have initially 300 Kelvin. Now we can solve this mathematically. I don't want to challenge you here, so I go here, I go click, 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 and here the final, the final result. Temperature and the function of time, average temperature in there, goes like this one. This is the final temperature of the outside, and these are the terms that describes how you indicate it. And you see that the temperature, all the terms depend only on on numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, n. They depend on the radius, but they depend, depend on one quantity, namely on the heat diffusion coefficient. So also the, the, the behavior of the system depends on the geometry and on the heat diffusion coefficient. And if you are fitting now this, this formula to this data, you're getting a heat diffusion coefficient, this one. This heat diffusion coefficient. And so I did this, uh, this exercise actually for the course here. But then we asked ourselves, uh, where does this heat diffusion coefficient come from? Is it interesting? Can we somehow make sense of it? And then we were looking and looking and looking. and uh, And and there is a very fair handbook of mathematics and physics where you have all kinds of constants, including heat diffusion coefficient of all kinds of material, including what should we have been looking at when we look at protein, diffu heat diffusion protein. 
including the heat diffusion coefficient of fresh of fresh steak. That's not so very good. So, so steak, fresh steak is protein, right? So that is a heat diffusion coefficient of fresh steak. So then we published it, got a very nice paper out of it, and, and many people were happy with it. So you see that you are that you see that you are not only get statistical properties described, you also get dynamic properties described how heat diffuses through a protein. But 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 be aware of it is sort of an interesting lesson. So here we have I think about a radius of I think about twenty angstrom and see how quickly the heat the heat goes away. Within a few picoseconds the heat goes away. So you cannot hold energy long in a protein. It goes like zip. So this is one of the deepest tricks of, of, of molecular cell biology, to keep energy long. If you just keep it statistically, you cannot bottle energy. You say, oh, I warm something up there. I try to keep the energy there. Within picoseconds, it goes away. It dissipates all over. So if you want to keep energy somewhere in the cell for, for, for a microsecond, for milliseconds, for seconds, or minutes, or hours, you really have to make inventions. So that is really totally non-trivial how a cell does this. And, and I speak from the bottom of my heart because when I was a little boy, I wanted to become a biologist to understand how Somebody told me this is really a deep problem. How does nature do it? And to, to this day, in many cases, I still don't understand it. Literally, that's really quite amazing how it is being done, how nature can store energy despite all the fact that whoop, if you don't store it well, just do it seems naively, energy goes totally away. So, it's, uh, so you have to be aware that that store energy in, 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 in biological system is totally non-trivial, particularly to do it for times like milliseconds and longer. And so you, uh, you should be very, uh, very respectful of it. OK, good. So now, I, now we end with a little fun with some examples. But we could have a question or two. And then we, we end with a little, uh, sort of like a pretty, pretty cute, cute <laughs> ending. So, so any questions? <coughs> there is one. Uh, professor, you pointed out uh, how the variance of the average temperature goes as the number of atoms of mm -hmm. the relationship there. It seemed to me that in molecular dynamics, when the Yes, uh, yes. This like one I told you, this one was NVE ensemble. And if you have an NVT ensemble, you might see a totally flat line or just a few. It's totally damped out, these fluctuations. So then, then you are constantly controlling it back within, within a picosecond or so. And so then you, uh, you don't see the fluctuations anymore. But here we have an NVE. What happens in the NVE is energy is, is conserved, but you constantly shift energy force and back between kinetic energy and potential energy. It's like an economy. They deal with each other by kicking each other. Then kinetic energy becomes potential energy. Potential energy becomes kinetic energy force and back, force and back. Different kinds of kinetic uh, potential energy are being changed. And so you have this exchange going on. If you ask that any member of the society, how much money do you have in your billfold, it always fluctuates. That if you have a law, like you have to have $10 in your billfold, no, no less or your more, or we shoot you, then uh, everybody has $10. ten dollars. $10, $10. Wouldn't be a good economy, but OK. So here we have this uh, idea back that I started with, that Simulations are like a microscope. We explore things like here we, we explore um, the binding of Tamiflu uh, to, uh, to new aminidase. 
the influenza protein. And so you can imagine that you can look at these processes with a, with a, micros with a computation microscope and understand them better. Now I want to give you some more examples. Like here's one example from the living cell where the cell has many internal membranes. I showed it to you before. And they have many, many forms, the membranes. And now how, how does nature achieve to make these membranes, give the membranes the forms? Now, there are special proteins that do that. For each type of membrane, you have, you have a special protein. And so here you see how one protein is doing it. The proteins are binding to the surface of a membrane, and they are like bananas. And they, they, they impose their shape onto the membrane so that the membrane then has the same curvature as a banana. And so then you see how the membrane slowly curves and curves. And now the ends finally meet after a while. And then the membrane seals itself. And now these guys can fall off, but the tube stays. So you form a tube, and then they go off. And the tube is so stable that you, you don't rupture. It can, of course, rupture at one point, but you know it's a slow process. Now, uh, when, we, when we did these calculations, we couldn't get a single paper published. That because people said total rubbish. They said that, uh, that uh, uh, oh, these proteins are never at a concentration so high that as you put it there. They could never do this job because the concentration is much lower. And, uh, and nothing we could do. Then one day, People took an electron micrograph of this. This is what they saw. And this is where they see the protein, exactly the same place as where we have them. And now we were the heroes. And we could publish everything, and, and, and we were great. And then we understood ourselves what was going on. It's what I told you already. This is like a team of construction workers. They work on one tube, and when they're done, they go to the next tube. And they go to the next tube. And so on the average, you have a very low concentration but, uh, of, of construction workers. But at the construction site, we have lots of them. And that is how it comes, and that why, why they actually work like this, as you see here. But, uh, but, uh, but they, they don't have everywhere the same, con the same concentration. So here you see another example, actually from uh, from, uh, from the Mayo Clinic, where we worked with, an, with a cardiologist. And so he worked on, on, inf on, on infarct patients, and, and he measured uh, uh, people who just had a fresh infarct, a heart infarct. What happens is that you have a blood clot in, your, uh, in, in the arteries around your heart that, uh, that, uh, that uh, limits the blood supply to the heart. And these blood clots are actually good things when, when they arise under normal circumstances, when you have an injury. Then blood clots form because they have a different flow pattern in the, near the injured uh, um, artery. And then they seal the artery. So it's just good. But, uh, but uh, 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 then uh, uh, some people develop blood clots in their blood vessels that are uh, not right. And uh, the difference is mainly that their blood clots are, are mechanically not soft enough. They are very brittle. They break easily. And, uh, and that is actually what leads to infarct and uh, lesion, uh, seizures and uh, to, to, to lesions in the, in the brain and so on. And so what, what this fellow did is he, he, he measured blood clots. And here you see a blood clot is made of red blood particles connected to protein fib fibrils that are made of this particular protein here. And, um, and uh, fibrinogen, it's called. And so this has many fibrinogens that form together these fibrils that glue together the red blood particles. And he, 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 he took from the blood samples the single fib fibrinogen molecules, and then he pulls them with an atomic force microscope. 
and he measured, as he pulled it out, he measured what force he needed. And so first uh, the fibrinogen was sort of like a, like a rope, a little bit curled. And he straightened it out first. You didn't need any force to, to a curly protein to just straighten it. But now he extended it. And now he got a linear increase, then a little step, then a further increase, constant, then suddenly a very low force system almost got all apart, and then in several steps, very strong, and then it stopped, because now it was totally extended. So that's what he measured, and he wanted to know where it comes from, because he wants to develop drug treatments against these kind of brittle bl blood clots. So he thought maybe by giving certain medications, you can prevent this brittleness. And so now we did the same in the simulation. Our simulation started with a straight protein. So the, the initial uh, uh, so we started here. And now you see that when we, when we stretch it, we get exactly this behavior. We stretch the protein, we get a linear increase, a step, then a higher step. And now we see that here it goes down. Let me see what happens here. Why does it go down? Why will it go down? Let me see, let me see. Look here. Suddenly there's an unraveling there in the middle. That's why it goes down. And then we go up here, and now we have it totally stretched out. So we're getting the same result. Good, but oh, very nice, same result. Publish a paper, but nothing learned. Now we can do the same, but look at it more closely to see what is actually happening. And so now we do the same, but now we zoom. And so now we see here we have a part of the protein that has alpha helices in parallel, and here just two alpha helices. Here are three alpha helices in parallel that we stretch out. Here another set of three alpha helices that we stretch out. Now we come to the central part that we unravel. And now we come to the part where there are four alpha helices in parallel, where we need a higher force, here the four. So we see the detail. We see the molecular detail where it's coming from. And now we can translate that into chemis chemical treatments, drug treatments, to see where, this, uh, where the brittleness can be affected and where we can make a change. So this is exactly the computational microscope. You can reproduce an experiment, but now you can look in great detail, atom by atom, what is going on, and, 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 and thereby really have a deeper understanding for the system's behavior and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and develop uh, new suggestions for treatment. So here we do, do the simulation twice, a very expensive simulation. So it took us, a referee forced us to do it, so we did it. And you see we're getting the same behavior twice, so it's not like it's just a fluke. Okay, so here, when you do this atomic force microscopy experiments, you are doing the experiments, and the atomic force microscopy experiment takes like a millisecond, or even slower than a, a second. And in our simulations, particularly initially, we just could do nanosecond simulations. So a, a millisecond and a nanosecond is six orders of magnitude difference. So we pulled very fast, they pulled very slow. How do we know we get the same thing? And now you see that what happens is that we, with the experiment, uh, with the computation, learned to pull more and more slowly because the computers became more powerful. We could do longer and longer simulation until a microsecond. <laughs> and the atomic force microscopists built built a more and more sensitive instrument by making the tip <laughs> of the atomic force microscope that actually does the pulling, making it smaller and smaller and smaller. So that's a mass involved for smaller that they could much better time sensitivity. And so we see we are getting together. We are not quite together yet, but now we are only two and a half orders of magnitude uh, separated. But you see here we have a theoretical curve that is sort of like a qualitative theory from these guys. And you see that we follow very nicely here this difference we understand. So we followed here in the theory exactly the simulation conditions. If we would have followed the experiment condition, the curve would have gone lower here. 
Toby just said, oh, so, so we understand it's different, so that's not a big deal. So we see that we are getting there. And so this also tells you actually something about the field of molecular cell biology. 20 years ago, they said, oh, theoretical biologists, uh, modelers, don't even talk to them, idiots. Don't believe what they say. But they change dramatically today. They come and want you to collaborate with them because you can have closer looks and bring understanding. And they very often work very, very hard with us together to get us closer together and, uh, and to work on the same time scale. The same kind of graph we have for protein folding, where the experimentalist made protein that folded faster and faster. And we could, could simulate longer and longer so that today, actually, with protein folding, we have experiments and simulation exactly on the same time scale. So, so that tells you a little bit about how the experimental and the modeling side is merging. So here we have, um, here we have a system a little larger, namely the system that translates genetic information on proteins in the form of messenger RNA that was transcribed from DNA, from genome, uh, and is then read by the ribosome. Here we have the ribosome, and the ribosome binds the messenger RNA, and then, it, um, then in this case, the ribosome is, uh, the messenger RNA is coding for a membrane protein. In this case, the ribosome docks to the membrane and has a channel bound to the ribosome that, that, uh, that, uh, that can take the new protein. And so here we have now the, 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 the way the new protein is to go. The protein is made near the messenger RNA and moves through the ribosome as it grows into the membrane. Very complex process. You have to bind the messenger RNA. You have to get all the amino acids added. The pro growing protein, the nascent protein grows in the ribosome, goes through this channel, so called the translocon into the membrane. And, uh, and uh, so this is what it's doing. This is some detail. And now this is uh, how the system looks like. Here you see the nest protein. But how do we know? And so what we knew it was from electron microscopy, they built exactly the system I showed you. They built the ribosome. With the, nascent pro with the messenger RNA, the nascent protein, the, tran the, the transfer RNAs, and the membrane with the translocon in there. But this is the resolution they got. You don't see much. They tell you it's a system, but you cannot see any, any detail. But now through modeling, you can now assign to this density a structure. So, so really, if you compare this in detail, you can really compare every piece to, to the density you see here. And so then you're getting an interpretation out of this, out of this, um, out of this density. And then you see in detail how the nascent protein comes out of the ribosome, goes through the translocon shown in gray, and, and loops itself here into the membrane. And so a very complex system that was for the first time um, uh, prepared in electron microscopy, and then structure evolved in the computer. <coughs> and so you see also this is like new biology. Like in old days, people just worked on the translocon by itself. Many, many papers. Today, no. Today, you, you, we are more ambitious. We say we want to understand the ribosome bound to the membrane, bound to the translocon, and nascent protein coming out there. How do these systems all talk to each other, work together? Forget about only the one component thing. You need to know the component, but you also want to know how the components actually integrate together. And that is what, what you see uh, is, is happening here. Here we see another case, a simpler case, which turned out to be actually harder. Namely, this is the case where the ribosome uh, 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 synthesizes the protein that is water soluble. So here comes the protein, the nascent protein out in red, and it's a cytosylic protein that goes into the cytosol of the cell, goes in the water, 
but it's a it's a it's a nascent, it's a baby protein not properly formed and what, uh, not properly folded and what happens is enzymes immediately go and chew it up and so there has to be a protection of this protein and this is done by this protein called the transcription factor it sits there at the exit of the ribo of the ribosome and it moves like crazy it's incredibly mobile but very difficult to actually see in the electron microscopy and, uh, and very mobile because it shoots away all enzymes that want to do harm to the to the new protein and uh, and, uh, and then the protein is unharmed come come out here can begin to fold up and then once it is folded enough it leaves this area and is then already sufficiently protected so so again you know one of these systems issues that are being looked at now we also can do with our computational microscope uh, technical systems like uh, like uh, <coughs> one of the issues in in modern medicine is to, to measure very small samples and so that you can do with so-called nano devices here we have a nano device that is a that is a nanopore it's a silicon very narrow silicon 20 uh, 20 to 40 angstrom thick and here only a few angstrom wide a pore and through this pore go ions because they're an electric field and along with the ions goes DNA you see here DNA goes through this one and this is a view that you get with an LA, with a with a computational microscope the experimentalists measure this but they don't know what's going on in there and so we know what is going on and they did a very interesting experiment they you know that there is uh, something called epigenetic that you can acquire properties uh, uh, in your in your in an organism in a human organism too that that comes through through influences like your diet your 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 uh, how much exercise you do uh, um, also sometimes life experience and they lead to the methylation of DNA you call that an epigenetic uh, uh, control and when you methylate DNA you make a very small difference to the DNA here you see unmethylated DNA and methylated DNA very very small differences you only mes methylate the DNA at very few spots not all over and now when you are sending the DNA methylated, unmethylated through very narrow pores. The pore is too narrow for the DNA, but when you put a voltage on, you can squeeze the negatively charged DNA through the pore. Then what you find is for a not methylated DNA to squeeze it through a pore, you need a voltage of three and a half volt to squeeze it through. But when you methylate the DNA, it goes through already at a voltage of about two, two and a half volt. So, so the reason is that methylated DNA is much more ordered when it goes through there than non-methylated DNA. You have a more disruptive motions uh, without the methyl group and with the methyl group, the DNA is actually locally much more structured. And so that is what you see in these, uh, through, these, through these measurements. But the only way to really realize this interpretation is through the simulation that shows you this kind of structure and that kind of structure and that shows you that in fact the DNA fits much better through a narrow pore when it's methylated than when it's non-methylated even though it's a little thicker it is because the methyl groups um, uh, uh, are more favorable for a well-structured DNA and here you see I think that's my last example here you see an, an uh, another nanosensor built for cancer research many cancer cancers uh, uh, experience errors in the in the signaling of cells and the signaling of cells comes often uh, 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 about through kinases kinases are proteins that phosphorylate other proteins and when a kinase is not doing its job properly then the cell can develop cancer and so you want to have assays for measuring the activity of certain kinases. And here you see a protein. Here we see now 
the, the sensor that we built, we put on the gold substrate, we, we, we put short pieces of, of proteins that had, a, that had a tyrosine group that can be phosphorylated through a kinase. And when it's phosphorylated, it assumes a negative charge. And if we are now giving the gold surface a positive charge, then, the, then when it's phosphorylated, the, the phosphors move down. When we give it a negative charge, they move up. And now we can measure the differences in what is called resonance Raman scattering. And there we can see clearly in the signals if the kinase, is, uh, if the kinase has, has phosphorylated the groups or not. So you see a difference in one case uh, uh, where, um, uh, and in the other case from these, from these kind of scattering, we, we see that if we got proper phosphorylation. Now to optimize this, um, we needed a computer. So when the, when the uh, bioengineers and nanoengineers, when they developed it, they got first a totally messy thing. It didn't work. They said, oh, we have this good idea, but it doesn't work. Well, what's happening? And we could tell them that they had chosen sequences that led to aggregation. Things were clumping together and didn't work well. We said, no, you have to choose different sequences. Here, how, why don't we choose this sequence? And then we optimized the sequence, and then we got a very clear result. So literally, we could look with the computational microscope and say, no, change it a little bit around. No, no, not this one. That leads to clumping. Take, uh, take other, other amino acid side groups. And then we got in, at the end, a very nice result. We really played a very important role there. And in nano, in nano devices, you have wet devices, and there are no other imaging light because microscope works in principle, but doesn't have the resolution. Electron microscopy needs to be dry or frozen. And so the only microscopy you have is a, the computational microscope. So it's really a great case of, of, uh, of studying these kind of systems. <coughs> so I think that is, uh, that is it. So, OK, good. So I, I covered. I covered uh, the um, molecular dynamics a little bit, and so I think we still could have an opportunity for uh, for a for a few questions. I just uh, the Yvette Baha joining us, so uh, so Yvette Baha is uh, director of the NIH uh, Technology Center here. She's actually your host, and. Uh, and she invited me to along to, to give my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Yvette. And so you will, you will uh, meet her and, uh, and get to know her and get to also know her technology center. And um, Markus Dietrich is also uh, working for that center. And so you will hear more from them. OK, so just if you have a few questions uh, about uh, Molecular dynamics, and maybe I can answer uh, a little more. Otherwise, we do it this afternoon. So you're all speechless, or you're hungry, <laughs> or you're hungry. I have a question about the packages that are available online, such as Duromag and Lang. And mm -hmm. So I mean, now we have a great idea of how mm -hmm. enzymes work. Mm -hmm. So, so, uh, so there are actually answers. So first, uh, <coughs> we are a really an extremely friendly community. We give our software freely, and that sort of tells you that we are not there for the money, fight uh, competition, but you know all these other, most of the other software also free, and uh, so we are really in a very collegial uh, situation. We talk to each other, we try to help each other, and so on. So, um, so I would say NEMD is probably the program that is, uh, that is good. It runs on American supercomputers and also runs in Europe, but American is all available, always in the latest form. It is uh, particularly good when you do larger systems. Um, uh, it is also very nice because it's connected to the sister program, DMD, you know, they work together very closely. 
So maybe you can, that's what I can say about this problem. LAMPS is a problem that is more for material science, for smaller system. It is sort of easier to change if you're a physicist and you want to, to do something different. Uh, NEMD is, you know, a pretty big problem now. And so to, to program directly into NEMD for you is difficult. Uh, and if you come to us or we work with you, then it can be done. But if you say, oh, I don't want to tell anybody, I have a real cool idea. You might want to work better with MAMS, and then when you publish it, come to say, oh, you, you NEMD guys, you want to work with me. Uh, Gromax is also a program that works on, on pretty big systems, but it's a program tuned for, for performance. Uh, for example, they use a lot for membrane simulations. They, uh, they actually have a force field where they use United Atom model, they don't represent every hydrogen atom, getting the countdown, they don't have this hydrogen light, light uh, a mass that vibrates a lot and, and, and you need to do a short integration time step. But they do it pretty controlled and pretty good. So if you want, uh, uh, then you have EMBA. EMBA is, uh, uh, is a problem that works very good in, uh, with nucleic acids. So for example, we use ourselves uh, EMBA force field, not the EMBA program for, uh, for simulations because they are better, like for example in case of ribosome, their parameters are better. Now we can use it with NEMD, as I told you, but you might also want it just with, 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 with EMBA. EMBA has also some very nice algorithms to prepare simulations. CHARM is, uh, is a program that is uh, extremely broad. You can do many, many things with CHARM, but it's not a very fast program. So if you, if you, if you are part of the CHARM community and you really need to do quantum chemistry and some new uh, free energy perturbation method or something, it might be there because they have so many things, but it's uh, at the same time it's, it has uh, too many things in a way, and particularly it's not done for modern computers. Uh, it's not so so fast and so so, but basically I want to tell you they all have some good things and bad things you <laughs> should ask and uh, we, we, we definitely will be talking frankly also the, the, pro, the, 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 the suite that, that, uh, that um, Yvette Ma and her colleagues develop is more for analysis of, of, of motions, very, very important, very strong analysis suite they have, you will learn about it here, uh, that's also a part, so I, I try to tell you that VND has lots of analysis, and yes it has, but it is not really quite as powerful as uh, what Ivan is preparing. Maybe we join at some point and put it together. Uh, so, so it is a broad community, and to me we are very cordial and collegial with each other. And it's also good that you have not just one program, one dictatorship, but you have, you know, like a variety, and so that, that's all, all very good. Okay, so, so I think, uh, yeah, okay. Okay, good, uh, my voice is losing anyway, so maybe that's a good, good moment for me to stop. So I really enjoyed uh, um, talking to you, and I hope you learned something from my lectures. And I told you already the more important part is in the afternoon. This afternoon, we, most of you will be working on MD, I assume. I will be around. I will be leaving at 5. But if you want to talk to me, I, I set up already a few uh, meetings with, with people here. Uh, please try to see me before 5 o'clock, then I will be gone. Okay, very good. <laughs>